Well, it's 9.02 in the morning here. Um, let's get started with some prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that if your presence doesn't go with us, don't take us up, man. Amen. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in your sight? Is it not that your presence goes with us? Yes, it is. Hallelujah. So shall we be separated, both I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for those that are watching on the broadcast, Father, and those that will hear the broadcast in the future, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, that you quicken us according to your word, for your word is truth, Father. And I invite you this morning, Holy Ghost, I invite you to, as you quicken the brothers and sisters, amen. Quicken us, O God, according to your word, for your word is truth. Amen. In him was life, and the life was the light. Amen. That's what we need. We need your life that would give us light. Amen. I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name for this day, Father. And I invite you, Father. I invite you into this hour, into this time, O God. I thank you, Lord God, for your presence. Amen. Even last night and yesterday, Father God, this morning I woke up with such a surge in the spirit. Amen. And I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you're wanting and you're causing your people to press forth, press forward. Amen. Constantly seeking, constantly searching you out, Father. I thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, J.B. Chapman, how you doing? Kathy Burkeen and Cecile Anders, good morning. Hallelujah. Rogelio, how you doing, sir? Good morning, sir. Amen. Well, we've been talking about um, the doctrine of baptisms, which are which is the third foundational principle. Hey, Wilbur. Which is the third foundational principle in the foundational principles found in Ephesians? I mean, uh, Hebrews chapter six. Chris, how you doing, sir? And let's take a look at that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. The word, the word, the word, amen. If one thing is needful, it's what he told Martha. And his name is Jesus Christ, amen. Hebrews chapter 6. Starts off with, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So, we see there there are six foundational principles, six six principles that hello Mr. Joe Roberts, that the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, talked about. Therefore leaving the principles. Principles is first things. You know how when you receive instruction and normally like myself when I'm talking to my sons, I give them the instructions in a certain order because I want them to do this first, and then this, and then this. Well, that's how you can look at these principles and that they're instructions. In other words, you need to have these principles girding you up, foundation, in other words, so that when you hear doctrines and teachings that are out there, which Jesus said, there's going to be many false prophets, many false apostles, false teachers, false shepherds, you see, and really it boils down to what is the motive, what is the, uh, where, where is the, what is the motive of the person, etc. What is their goal? And Jesus said it plainly. He said, you know the doctrine and teaching, whether it's of me, whether they speak of themselves, you see. And that's it right there, is that who are they glorifying? Are they glorifying Jesus Christ? Because the scripture says of, um, of Jesus, when he said that the Comforter, when he has come, I'm going to send him to you. And he said of the Comforter that the Comforter is only going to be speaking of me. 
He's going to testify me, and he's going to bring to your remembrance to you the things that I've taught you. You see? So we need to be clear about that, is that what is the motive? Where is it coming from? And, see, the, and, then, and the thing about that is that the only thing that can give us that distinction to cause us to understand what is of the spirit, what is of the flesh, or the soul, is the word of God. And let me show you the scripture here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. <clears throat> For the word of God, <clears throat> the word the word there is the word logos in the Greek. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, uh, Jibby Ing Inkoy. For the word of God is quick and powerful. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divided asunder of soul and spirit. Hello, Dave Markath. Piercing even to the divine asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is, a, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You see there? So all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the divine asunder of the soul and spirit. And the word divine asunder is a Greek word marismos. And marismos means to make a, a separation for clarification. In other words, God's word is able to separate your life, my life, and go in between the pieces, the soul and the spirit, make a cut, in other words, and bring a distinction. Are you living in the spirit? Or are you living in the soul? And why is that important? Well, Jesus said it plainly. He said, it is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words, and that word where there is rhema, which means spoken word, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So in other words, those words that are spirit and life, those are the words that when he quickens to you in your spirit, you're able to see clearly in the, in, in the realm of the spirit, through your spiritual eyes, what he's trying to do and what he's saying and where he's speaking at. And when, when we're in the soul, see, the thing about our soul is that before Adam sinned, he had one nature and two lives, okay? One nature, which was divine nature, and he had two lives. He had his life with God, the Father, and he had his life with himself, his soul. But the thing about that is that his soul was not offensive to the Lord, you see? You understand what I'm saying? His soul was not offensive to God. Okay? And what does that say? What does that say? Well, that says that what he did and what he thought and what he said and what he allowed himself to see and hear and say and what he was doing in his life, God wasn't offended in that. But then when he lost the divine nature by making a choice, he disobeyed. When you obey, you die to yourself. That's, that's, that's the simplest uh, form that, 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 that God has been showing me, is that obedience is, uh, is dying to yourself. And when you obey, you're making a choice. You're saying, not my life, not my will, but your will. Not my whatever I want to do, but what you want me to do, Father. Okay, so Adam, when he lost the divine nature, when he made a choice, and when I say he, it was Eve, but it was both of them. He made a choice outside of what God said, Thou shalt not eat of this tree, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to die. They didn't die physically, because Adam lived to be 900 something years old. They died spiritually, you see. The spiritual man lost the breath of God, lost the life of God. He could no longer commune with God. He could no longer hear from God. He could no longer receive direction from God. He could no longer get the clarity on the purpose of God for his life. Up to that point, he had been living in God. He had been living with God. He wasn't offensive to the Lord, but now you've transgressed, you've crossed the line, you've rebelled. In other words, rebellion, the scripture says, is that it's a sin of witchcraft. You understand? And, and in that rebellion, and in that disobedience, he lost the breath of God. <clears throat> He could no longer hear from the Spirit, see from the Spirit, 
walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, communicate in the Spirit, love in the Spirit. He couldn't do any of this thing. It was all now suke, natural. Or, or in, that, in that sense, it was nefesh. Nefesh is the Hebrew word for the word soul. And in the New Testament, soul is suke. Anything suke, suke. Psychology, psych, psych, and then logia, psych, logia. Suke, logic, in other words. So, <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make here is that when he lost the divine nature of God, he lost the breath of God, he lost the life of God. But somebody came to bring it back to us, and his name was Jesus Christ. And this teaching is called the Great Exchange. Jesus exchanged life for life. In other words, what Adam saved when he tried to preserve himself with the fig leaves and aprons, you see, because he tried to cover himself, because the number one strength of the soul is self-preservation. Your soul always thinks of himself first. The natural first the natural thing okay so <clears throat> in the great exchange Jesus gave his life of his suke the scripture says in Isaiah that he gave his soul was an offering for sin his soul man he gave up what he wanted to do in his life hey Daniel how are you sir he gave up his life that we could have the divine life which was Zoe which was God's life what Adam lost, Jesus gave it up, and therefore we gave it, gained. But then, even in, even still, although he's done that work, we still must deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow him. You've got to say no to yourself. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize that I am not my own, but I've been bought with the price. Therefore will I glorify you in my body and in my spirit, which belong to you, God. You see, you recognize that every day you make a choice, not my will, but thine will. Jesus, what do you want me to do today? Hey, Ricky Neal, Greg Ballard, hallelujah. What do you want me to do today, Father? What is your desire for me? Quicken me in my spirit, Lord God, that I might be led of your spirit. Amen. For as the scripture says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led of the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And that's what we want. We want to be led of the spirit. We want to live in the spirit. We want to walk in the spirit. You see, we want to speak in the Spirit, we want to hear, we want to see in the Spirit. That's what I want. Amen? As the Son of God. John 1.12 says, For as many as received Him, to them give you the power, which is the Greek word authority, to become the sons of God. Power is the word exousia, which means authority. To become the sons of God. Sons of God in the earth. That word sons is the word technon, which means that we're, st we're growing into maturity. And that's what this whole thing is, is about the foundational principles. As you look at verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. <clears throat> and this will we do if God permit. You see, in verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So he doesn't want you to go through this again. He wants you to get this foundation. He wants you to build on it and continue to build it and use it in your life in the Spirit. When you hear teachings and doctrines and principles from others that are not teaching this word, so they're teaching another doctrine the scripture calls it. And let me show you a scripture in, in John, Second John. So precious, amen. Mm. Verse 9, Second John 1, 9. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not, abides not, it means remains not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. In other words, he's saying that you're not moving in the Spirit. You're moving after yourself. You're moving after your own doctrine. You're moving after your own motives, your own desires, and, and your own whatever you want, whatever feels good. You see, the, 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 the Christian, the Son of God, the daughter of God, we're living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus Christ is our Savior. And He's our Lord. As your Savior, He died for you. He showed you the way. He, he, he shed His blood. He rose on the third day. Amen. These are the things that we've, we've been given in the Lord. But now, we've got to come under Lordship, which means we've got to come under discipleship. Dis disciple means discipline or to be disciplined. Okay? And there's, a, there's, there's an obedience. There's obedience that you have to walk into the Word. When you get confronted with the Word of God, are you going to choose God's word, his life, or are you going to choose your life? And earlier I said that now Adam was not offensive to the Lord when he had the life of God, but now that he lost the life of God, now 
He's got to work the land. He's got to think for himself. He's got to conclude for himself. If I do this, this is going to happen. Hey, David, how you doing, sir? You understand? If I do this thing, then this is going to happen. He had to rationalize and come up with all these conclusions on his own, where before that, he just knew, for example, the names of all the animals. Amen? And God, in His mercy, glory to God, gave us another, gave us Jesus Christ, amen, and showed us the way through Christ. So it says here, <clears throat> whosoever, 2 John 1, 9, transgresseth, 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 amen, which means to violate a command to go contrary to, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he hath I'm sorry, he that abideth, which means remain in the doctrine of Christ, amen, has both the Father and the Son, amen. And if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine that these apostles that have been teaching, amen, when they got it straight from Jesus Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Godspeed means don't rejoice with them, don't be glad with them, or heard, don't, don't, don't be well with them, don't thrive with them, don't salute them, don't hail them, don't cheer them. Amen? For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Wow. Amen. See, there, there's, a, there's a distinction here. We've got to be sanctified continuously unto the Lord. The scripture talks about in, in Hebrews chapter 2 that both for both he that sanctifieth which is God, which is His Word. Jesus said, Sanctify them through Thy Word in John 17. Amen? For both He that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are of one. One purpose, one mind, one goal. Amen? Which is Jesus Christ and His will. Amen? In the earth. You know, this week uh, I was watching the news. And it was so funny because the day before that my son had asked me something about uh, hello, Jamie Chen. Had asked me something about. He noticed that or he heard that there was two saints that were going to get uh, canonized. <clears throat> and I said, "Well, sweetie, that stuff is out of order, man. That stuff is all worldly." <clears throat> and I said, "As a matter of fact, the scripture says that you are a saint. Saint means holy. Okay, set of, set, um, set apart." Take a look at this scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. This is Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Amen. To the saints which are in Ephesus. Saints is the word holy, sanctified, set apart. When you're holy, when you're sanctified, when you're set apart unto the Lord, you're his instrument now. You're his utensil. You're his vessel. You are God's for him to command and use you as he needs to on the earth, which is to fulfill his will. Amen? So, anyway, it's just so interesting how the world is so caught up in all this perversion and trash that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Amen? Man might recognize him as some kind of, you know, a holy being that needs to be exalted, but not the kingdom of God. Amen? You see? The one that we need to be glorifying is God, not ourselves. Amen. And not other men. Uh, you know what? Uh, I got something so precious from the Lord this week. Uh, I was reading the scripture that talks about, Jesus talks about, um, let me see if I can find it here. Man, this thing is... Alright. Hang on a second, please. Uh, let your eye be single. Matthew 6.22. Start with Matthew 6.22. Mm. Let's start with verse 20. He says, But lay up for yourselves, Matthew 6.20, Treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your heart is, 
those two words, treasures, the word the sorrows, which means a repository, a storehouse. For where your heart is, there will your treasure be. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Whatever you value, there will your heart be. Whatever you value, that's where your heart is going to be. So if you value the kingdom of God, the ways of God, the word of God, the will of God, the work of God, the way of God, etc., 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 that's where your treasure is. And that's where your heart's going to be focused at. He says, the light of the body is the eye. Okay? If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. In other words, if your eye, if your goal is whatever you set your heart on is single-minded, then you're going to accomplish that goal. Okay? And, and, and the thing is, is that Obviously, but if your eyes is, is, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and you never set any goal or focus or purpose to where you're headed and where you're going, then obviously you're not going to accomplish that goal in any kind of efficiency. And then he says in verse 23, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. He's trying to tell you here is that, you know, your focus, your treasure, okay, hey, uh, Doug Renfro, your focus should be me, Jesus Christ, not, you know, your, your goals and your desires. And that doesn't mean God also doesn't want us to take care of our families and do our part. The point I'm trying to make is here is that the motive is always being challenged. What is, wherever you're headed and whatever, is, whatever you're involved in, you know, first of all, is to line up with the Word of God. If it's not in the Word of God, in other words, if you're involved in sin and perversion and stuff and it's not part of the kingdom of God, the Word of God, then you're going to be separated. You're going to be full of darkness. You're not going to get to where you need to be getting to. Now, I said that to go to Ephesians chapter 1. And I was in my home yesterday and I saw this. It was just so precious. And there's a reason why that, that the eye, you see, what he's saying there is that if, if the eye be single, in other words, not your natural eye, but your spiritual eyes and ears. You see, if you're focused in spirit, if you're being driven by the Lord in spirit, okay? And, and in verse uh, chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Amen? And that word enlightened is the Greek word photizo. How you doing, Greg? Romans? Photizo, okay? Which means to give light to shine. That word comes from the Greek word phos, which means light. Now, when you, you tie all this up with, it was John, with John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light, the phos of man. And the life, there's the word zoe, God's life. When that life that I was talking about earlier, the great exchange, when you exchange yourself, you're still okay, you die to yourself daily, you're going to get in return God's life. And in that life, you're going to be able to see now by the Spirit. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints you see and what is the exceeding greatness of his, of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power amen so that's what i'm trying to say here is that it's all gets gets back it always gets back to is it your life or his life hello cameron alexander you understand is it his life or your life praise god now Let's go back to, um, let's now, let's get back involved in our text here. We're talking this week about the doctrine of baptisms, and there's seven baptisms. And this time we're going to talk about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now, the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit, amen? Holy, sanctified. He's not going to get involved in carnality and perversion in our lives, Amen? And I'm not talking about dead works, being involved in dead works, which is the first foundational principle, is repentance from dead works. I'm not talking about doing all these good things so that we can be right with God. That's not how it works at all. Because the Bible says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Amen. <clears throat> now, part of that is that, you know, in, in, in this... What we're talking about now is the baptism into the Holy Ghost. So we've covered John's baptism, which is the baptism into repentance. 
and that was before Christ in our lives. And then Jesus' baptism, which is the baptism in the water. In other words, recognizing yourself, reckoning yourself dead with Christ, but alive unto God. Death, burial, and resurrection, in other words, the baptism in water. And that's after you're born again. And then baptism into the Holy Ghost. And uh, and and this is so crucial and so so vital in our lives is that the Holy Spirit is, you know, oh, clicked on something there. The Holy Spirit is uh, is is part of our lives, is involved in our lives, and uh, for a reason. Okay, so let's go to a scripture in Joel chapter two, verse twenty-eight. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. Amen. And so God had already been preparing them and speaking forth ahead of time to let them know that I'm going to pour up my spirit, amen, on all flesh, amen. Now, he said that your sons and your daughters, they're going to prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men, they're going to see visions, amen. And I believe that. I guess I'm, I'm old because I'm always dreaming. <laughs> but <clears throat> I do have a lot of dreams, amen, and I always sit on them. For quite a while, quite a while before I reveal them, unless it's something that God wants me, you know. Sometimes He'll give me a dream where He needs me to speak to an individual directly about some sin in their lives, and and thank God for His faithfulness. You know, thank God that He's still able to function that way and talk to us when we're not able to. You know, the Scripture talks about that <clears throat> about dreams in Job, and and sometimes you know he's got to bring it to you that way because you're not hearing all the other voice that he's trying to present to you and sh showing you. <clears throat> so, and uh, so th he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Now, the Comforter, Jesus called the Holy Ghost the Comforter. John chapter 14, verse 15. Verse 15 through 18. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Comforter is the Greek word parakletos, which means someone called to one side. Somebody else is going to walk alongside with you, praise God. <clears throat> that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world... Okay, the world there is the Greek word cosmos. The cosmos, the carnal man, the, the man that's living after the natural realm, he's not going to be able to see this. Amen. Hello, Mr. Doyle. Good morning, sir. So it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Praise God. Mm. Verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I'm not going to leave you orphans, parentless, you see. I will come to you. <clears throat> you understand? He said that the Holy Ghost is going to be uh, for you. It's because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Amen? Now let's take a look at uh, verse 26 there. Skip on down a little bit. But the Comforter, again the word parakletos, which is one, the one that comes alongside, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, under my authority, amen, under my character, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Amen. So you see, he's going he's gonna to come to us, and he's going to teach us things. He's going to show us and remind us and reveal to us things that have been taught to us by the Spirit himself. Amen. In John 15, 26. But when the Comforters come, 
whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and you also shall bear witness. Same word, testify. In other words, you also are going to testify, because ye have been with me from the beginning. In other words, you're going to bear witness to all this. You're going to be speaking it forth from your own life. Your life is going to be a witness unto me. And we're going to see that in a minute. What that means is why did we receive the Holy Ghost? Why did we receive the power? What was the goal there? And what is the goal? And uh, Isaiah 32.15, take a look at that verse. Isaiah 32.15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. You see that? Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness, the place that was, you know, out of order, out of control, chaos, confusion, is going to be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field will be counted for a forest. In other words, there's going to be so much resource there, glory to God. So much power, so much potential, glory to God, because of this precious Holy Spirit in our lives. Check, take a look at Luke 24. Praise God. You know, what's interesting is that every week before, you know, when, when, the, when I, you know, get, well, I ask God, you know, I constantly ask Him, Father, is this something that you want me to continue to press on in? You want me to keep doing these teachings. You want me to keep doing these lessons. And uh, it's so precious because yesterday in prayer, he led me to a scripture, you know, that, that I'll be looking at, we'll be looking at here in a minute. And <clears throat> I wasn't even trying to get to that, in other words. But he, in his, in his preciousness, he's always directing us, amen, in his will. If we'll, if we'll submit to that word and the will to work the way. All right, Luke 24, 49. He told him that, And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The word endued is the Greek word enduo. Enduo is like sinking into or putting on a, a garment. So like when I put on this jacket, amen, I endure it or I put it on. I, in other words, it's like if somebody was holding into me and I slide my sleeves up and stuff. And put it on me, I slip into it. And that's what he said, wait till be endued with power from on high. The word power is the Greek word <clears throat> dunamis. And dunamis means strength and power and ability. Inherit power, glory to God. And where does that inherit power uh, abide? In your spirit, amen. In your spirit, man, is where this power is at. And that's one of the, the precious things about, about God is that he didn't leave us without any resource. Amen. <laughs> he gave us the greatest resource we could, he could give us, which is his very spirit himself. Amen. So praise God that, uh, you know, Terry, wait until you're being dude. In other words, uh, I'm going to send you some, but you, you've got to wait for it. Amen. I want you all to take a look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. You know, the word of God on this subject about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, amen, is so clear, so apparent, so easy to understand if you'll hear it. But you know, we get, I remember coming up, <clears throat> you know, I was born again in a Baptist fellowship down there in Deleon, Texas, and I was, man, I was thrilled, man. I was just so elated with joy, glory to God. He forgave me for my sins. And God delivered me out of so much perversion and trash. But, uh, hey, Robert, how you doing, sir, Robert Moore? And 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 I remember talking to the brother from the fellowship. It was a it was a little fellowship right down the road. As a matter of fact, right next to the Dillion High School, which is where I graduated. And right next to that, right in front of that, there was a or beside it, there was a Baptist church there. And I remember that brother. He came to where I lived. And, and I remember we talked for about an hour, and he was just so gracious and so, so patient. And I said, well, am I going to have to change my life? And I, he said, well, yes. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my word. And I had asked him a bunch of questions like that. And, and um, 
<clears throat> Finally, uh, he said, well, Joe, are you, do you think you're ready to receive Jesus Christ? And I said, yes. And I got, I received Jesus Christ. You know, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in your heart <clears throat> that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Amen. So, anyway, uh, I got born again. And I remember, uh, you know, part of the fellowship, they had a Spanish fellowship in the back of the fellowship. And uh, I remember, you know, there being with that brother. And I asked him about, you know, what is the baptism of the Holy Ghost? And he just, you know, what is this thing about speaking in tongues and stuff? And, and he said to me, you know what, that's, that's just not something that you need to be involved in. It's not necessary. And, you know, I took him at face value, you know. This guy's more mature, more mature than me and things of God. And, you know, he must know what he's talking about. Well, he didn't. <laughs> and, uh, and it's again, it's so clear when you're reading the Word of God that, you know, these things and these truths. And the thing about it is, God's Word is eternal. You see? You know, the many, many brothers and sisters talk about there's no more apostles and prophets for today. Well, that's not true. You know? Uh, that's just totally false. Paul, Paul, the apostle Paul, wasn't even a part of the original 12 apostles. Yet he was an apostle also. And uh, there were many others, you see. But let's take a look at this. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And that word remission is pretty precious there. It means a freedom or a pardon, a release from bondage or imprisonment. Well, these, you know, these people that were being preached at, and even today when we, when we speak to our brothers and sisters or we speak to those out there in the world, they don't think they need uh, to be delivered from the bondage of sin. Or from that, that cloud of perversion and so on. But yes, we do. We've got to be constantly, you know, cleaned up and, and, and brought to the Lord to be able to be used as a vessel eventually, you know, for God. Because God's got a purpose, you understand? So it says, To be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that word gift is the Greek word doreo. And, and, and that is one of the nine different Greek words for the word gift. Okay? And the word gift doesn't just mean a gift like a present, like I'm giving you something. This word does mean the gift, something God gave us, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Dorea, the gratuity. Gratuity is, you know, you didn't earn this. I'm, I'm, I mean, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and, and, and it means a present. Amen? So, anyway, for the, so, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise of the Spirit. Hey, Sean, how you doing, sir? For the promise of the, is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see? So, wait, and he told them there's, it's going to be poured out. Peter said that the promise of the Spirit is unto you and to your children. The Spirit, the promise of the Spirit, amen. The promise unto you and to your children. The gift, as he called it in verse 38. And in, and uh, look, check a look at Acts chapter 5, verse 32. Acts chapter 5. And we are witnesses, his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom... God has given to them that obey Him. God gives the Holy Ghost to those who obey Him. Amen. And if it was something that wasn't something, that, in other words, if it was something you didn't have, why would He say that I'm giving it to you? I'm giving you this, Joseph. Here. Why would He say that? Something that's given. Amen. Take a look at uh, Acts chapter 8. Chapter 8. Start with verse 5. And this is about Philip. Hey, Sean Wagner. Dave Kostecki. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Acts chapter uh, 8, verse 5. Here's the outline for all you guys that uh, I can post it for you. I think it's this. I hope it is. All right. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. My goodness. Wow. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. I'm sorry, verse 7. For unclean spirits cried out with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and they were that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Okay, in verse 9. But there was a certain man named Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery a magician and bewitch the people bewitch is to throw out a position to displace to amaze of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is great in power of God in the power of God so they didn't have a distinction there about Acre and Kite they didn't have a distinction about the power of God you know, they were saying this guy that uses magic, he's also got the power of God. So they still didn't have a distinction about holiness there. And to him that had regarded because of that long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. So he tricked them, he manipulated them. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believes also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, amen, received it. That means they took it, they took it to, into their lives. Okay, the word of God they sent unto them Peter and John. And when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for as yet he was not fallen on them. Verse 16 there. Now, verse 18, And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Dorea again, you thought that the gift of the Holy Ghost, that the gift of God may be purchased with money. See, you ain't got no part in this matter, as he told him, and you ain't got no lot and no share in this thing, man. You're speaking out of your carnal realm. You're trying to figure out how to market this thing so you can get the people to continuously come unto you as they've been coming unto you. See, he didn't have a distinction about the holiness and the, and the kingdom of God. He thought it was only, uh, it was something that could be purchased. Okay? And the point is, is that <clears throat> they hadn't received the Holy Ghost yet. And uh, as it says in verse 16, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, but only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you see, it was something they didn't have. So you get born again, okay? My sons are born again. They're not baptized in the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> I praise God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pray for them, Amen. But the point is, is that they don't have the Holy Ghost right now. They, 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 they're, they're still sanctified and holy because I pray for them, and et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, is that it's something that these guys in the in the Acts chapter eight didn't have. And when they got their hands laid on them, somebody laid hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. You see, they received the Holy Ghost. They received it. They took it. Lambano. All right, so let's take a look at Acts chapter 10. And earlier I was talking about, <clears throat> and I've already known about this verse, but the point is, is that in prayer yesterday, I was I was reading and and. And he led me to this chapter, and, and, uh, and I was just so encouraged because this, once again, this is talking about individuals that didn't have the Holy Spirit, and uh, and and the Holy Ghost fell on them as a witness to say that that I'm I'm, I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. You see, 
So take a look at Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 46. Don't you listen to all these natural sounds being outside? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. So, so, so some of these guys went with Peter. Because Cornelius came to send some gentlemen to Peter to tell him that he needs to come to where he's at. And if you read the whole story here, is that, you know, uh, Peter obeyed and he, and, he, and he followed him. And there were some guys that went with them from, from the fellowship there in Jerusalem. And I'm sorry, was it Jerusalem? No. But the point is, is that, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Dorea of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Amen. They made, they made great. They magnified God. They, they esteemed Him. They extolled Him. They ext increased Him, in other words, in their lips and in their hearts. <clears throat> because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. Now watch this. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which shall receive the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So what does that tell us right there? Hey Melissa, how you doing? That tells you, you be born again. These guys were gotten born again. Then <clears throat> they got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then they got baptized in water. Isn't that something? So don't try to think that you can put God in a box, amen. He's not he's not a he's not a formula here that you can construct and, and, and put him in a box and say this is how it's supposed to be. <clears throat> now let's take a look at Acts chapter nineteen. This is again another passage that clearly defines that, that uh, there's a that, that these three baptisms that we've been speaking about well, they're all going to be defined right here in this chapter. Acts chapter 19. And it came to pass, verse 1, that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto then what unto what then were you baptized? So nobody was even talking about baptism here, and then Paul says, Well, what were you baptized into? Okay? And they said unto John's baptism. John's was a baptism unto repentance. Amen. And and this was before Jesus Christ came. But after Jesus Christ came, there's the baptism of, baptism into water and then the baptism in the Holy Ghost. So the point here is that Paul asked him, well, what were you baptized with? And they said unto John's baptism. So he, he referred to it as, have you received the Holy Ghost? So in other words, he said, and to them, what were you baptized if you weren't baptized into the Holy Ghost? Hello. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, which is on, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid, his, had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. So here we go. These guys were believers. They, and they got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, water baptism. And then they were baptized in the Holy Ghost when he's laid his hands on them. So there again... More examples of, of, of that the, this is a valid teaching, this is a foundational principle that must be a part of our lives. It's not, it's not something that, uh, that, that we should take lightly, amen? This word, this truth. You know, the thing about the Word of God is that we've got to be obedient to the Word of God. All the Word of God, not just the one parts that go, line up with our doctrine. <laughs> and again, I told you, you know, one of these, this, this guy told me... Uh, that this Holy Ghost and this speaking in tongues is not even something you need to be worried about. And I believed it. But thank God I kept pursuing truth and and thank God I kept pursuing the, pursuing God. Let's go into Acts chapter 1 verse 8. 
Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, the word receive is to take. You're going to take power. You're going to take it. Take that dunamis after that the Holy Ghost has come which means to, to arrive on you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. In other words, part of what the Holy Ghost and the power is about is that being a witness in the earth, not going out and passing tracks. And I'm not faulting that because people need information. What I'm saying is, is, that, is that your life now is a witness. You die to yourself daily. That power, that inherent power is ready to explode and come forth in any given situation. You see whether it be praying for someone to get healed, whether it be casting out devils, etc., etc., whether it be causing someone to hear, causing someone to see, you understand? There's a purpose for the power, and part of that purpose right here is that you can be a witness unto me. Now, endued to undo. We read that earlier, Luke 24, 49, wait to be endued with power from on high. Tarry ye till you be endued with power from on high. With dunamis is the Greek word there. All right? And you shall be a witness. He says not power just to witness, but power to be a witness. There's a difference there. There's a distinction there. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them which stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Amen. Power, glory to God. Power, explosiveness, inherent power, power, ability, force, and might to be able to accomplish the work of God, the will of God in the earth. I didn't leave you comfortless, he said. I'm going to send you another comforter. Amen. Glory to God. And now look, look at this. I love these words, man, this word. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. This is Paul. And my speech, my logos, my teachings, my word, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. Demonstration is the showing forth. And he needs to show off to exhibit. You see, God wants us exhibited. He needs it. It needs to be exhibited in the earth. People everywhere are dying and starving, and they're hungry for God, and they don't understand how to get to God. You know, see, they get involved in all this spiritual mumbo-jumbo, spiritual religion stuff that, that ain't got nothing to do with the kingdom of God. But praise God, God has His sons and daughters in the earth, that that's all they want is God to be glorified in the earth. And they're being sent forth, amen, and they are being witnesses, be a witness, not to witness, you see. They're being witnesses unto God. And they're moving, as Paul said here, uh, in verse, or was it, um, 2 4. And my preaching, and my speech, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration and the showing off and the exhibition of the Spirit and of power. Inherent power in your spirit, Lord God, exploding on the scene. Exploding in our lives. Amen. Added to his word. Glory to God. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4. Same same principle here that I just read in 1 Corinthians 2 4. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and marismos. That word gift there is marismos of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Divided severally as he will. The Holy Ghost divided severally as he will, which is what the word marismos is. As God's will comes forth, he brings the manifestation of what he desires and what he's coming forth with, what he wants to come forth with. Now, Confirming the word. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. 
So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Sunergio, working together, soon together, purpose together. That's the word soon means together. Working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Make to make confirm firm firm the word, establish the word with signs following. It's gonna be a part of your life, amen. When you're baptizing the Holy Ghost, there's signs that are following. Things are happening in the spirit. People are getting prayed for, people are getting delivered. You're being a witness of Jesus Christ in the earth, amen. Same thing about Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Same Holy Ghost. And Jesus returned in the power, in the dunamis of the Spirit, into Galilee, and there went out a fame of Him throughout all the region about. Amen. And I remember working in the stores, grocery store, and uh, praying for people. You know, I was so thrilled and excited about the kingdom of God and the word of God. And there was actually people that would come and they would bring their babies to me so I could pray for them. And then the next couple of weeks, there'd be somebody else that they brought so I could pray for them. <laughs> the word gets around, amen. The man of God's praying over there and the people are getting healed, amen. 1 Corinthians 14.2. Take a look at this. Talking about baptism the Holy Ghost. And they speak with tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. Okay? So there, part of what speaking in tongues is all about is that you're speaking mysteries unto God. Amen? And that's what the Word says, speaking mysteries. 1 Corinthians 2 talks about the wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of God. The natural man can't see the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. And Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency, excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, the martyrion, the witness of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, said Jesus Christ, and him crucified. So we see that, that, that that's the whole goal here is that that's, we don't, what we want is that we don't want to be anything else to be known except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's what the world needs, amen. They need to know that their sins have been forgiven and they need to be, they need to see the Holy Ghost, God in action, amen. <clears throat> First Corinthians, um, First Corinthians, again, talk, back with 14.4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. So there's an edification of yourself when you're praying the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, and there's a prophesying that edifies the body of Christ. There's prophecy that edifies the body of Christ. There's a distinction there. Take a look at Jude, Jude chapter 19, verse Jude 19 and 20. There's only one chapter in Jude. Oh, man. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but ye, beloved, building yourselves up, building yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal Zoe. Keep yourselves. You see, part of that power is to be able <clears throat> to be to be able to be at that place where you're speaking mysteries, where you're praying in the Holy Ghost and praying for others. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. This resurrected life, amen. Mm. Verse 26, 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth, glory to God, our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And where is this going on? This going on in your spirit, man. Okay, the scripture talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to read this verse 2. I think it's... Hello, John Denton. There it is, verse 13. 2.13, 1 Corinthians 
which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are no monticles or spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, when you're in the Spirit, you have the mind of Christ. You can pray the mind of Christ. I mean, you're praying, when you're praying to God, you're praying mysteries. So it says back over here in verse chapter 8 of Romans, starting with verse 27, and he that searcheth the hearts, in other words, talking about comparing spiritual with spiritual, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And that's how it happens for me, you know. When I start thinking about someone, I start praying, you know. And sometimes I don't even know I'm praying for people, amen. And I, ne I never get back a report that says, you know, I appreciate the prayers that you were praying for me. You've got to walk in faith in all this. It's not about... It's not about, you know, sometimes I, I get a report. There's one lady, you know, she she, she, um, she wrote me a message on one of these videos, and she said, you know, thank God that, uh, you know, what I was sharing, it, it ministered to her and it gave her some confirmation about her life. But the point I'm making is that you got to be always constantly firming yourself up in spirit, firm in, the Holy Go firm in the Holy Ghost, strong in the spirit, amen. As he says in Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong. That word strong is the word indunamo, which in is, it means to empower. And then it says, in the Lord and in the power of his might. Here's another word for the word power, which is the word kratos, which is the word dominion. Of his might is the word iskus, which means ability, force, strength, and might. So the power of his iskus, the dominion of his iskus, the force, amen. You got to walk in the spirit, amen dominate in the in the realm of the spirit as a king amen kings and priests of god melchizedek melech is king zedek is righteous kings and priests unto the lord priests unto the people amen and i'm and we're looking so see so again helpeth our infirmities and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of god <coughs> and the thing about it is is that there's so much more involved in the Holy Spirit. You know, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 14, Galatians chapter 3, Epicoriego, the choreograph of the Spirit. There's so much more, and we're going to get into all that in, in later teachings, but the point is, is that one of the doctrines of baptisms is the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and it's very relevant and still part of the body of Christ today. And I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, to seek out the Lord, seek after the being obedient to the Word of God. You see, not necessary, not after the denominations of men. Man, you know, talking about those things, <clears throat> those things of uh, of the Holy Spirit. And there's a teaching, and it's and it's, and it's on the YouTube channel. Um, and I encourage you guys to listen to those. Uh, I have different playlists set up under my channel, and and the point is, is that in that uh, one of them is called concerning pneumaticos, which is from the teaching of First Corinthians twelve one. And uh, God, oh, that's it. Yep. I'm gonna post the channel up here, so y'all can. Oh, come on, baby. All right, here we go. I'm posting the ch the YouTube channel on one of the um, Heather. How you doing, Heather? One of the uh, I'm posting up this my YouTube channel because one of the uh, playlists is called Concerning Pneumaticos, and that deals with things of the spirit. Concerning Pneumaticos is concerning spirituals. Paul in First Corinthians chapter twelve one says. Now, concerning spiritual, if you look at the word gifts, the word gifts is italicized. This is 1 Corinthians 12.1. Now, concerning spiritual, 
gifts. You see that word gifts? It's italicized. It's not a part of the original text. But they added it there for emphasis because they didn't know what else to, to put in there concerning spiritual what? So when you read that without the word gifts, and that's the question that, that, that gets uh, brought up, is that concerning spiritual what? So it says, now concerning spiritual, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ignorant means to ignore through disinclinations because, the, through disinclination because you don't think you're inclined, you need to go that way. You know, my kids, my boys, man, sometimes I say something to them and they just goes in one and out the other because they're ignoring it. They don't realize it, but that's what they're doing. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Now, uh, follow after charity, which is the Greek word agape, love, and desire spiritual gifts. Gifts is italicized again. But rather that you may prophesy. So Paul is saying, be hungry, be zealous after the things of the Spirit. And that's what I'm telling you right now is that part of what this the Holy Ghost is in our lives is that, you know, for me, it, it allows me to constantly strive for the mastery. You see, constantly strive towards... That sanctified life, in other words, living holy unto the Lord. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, for even so, for ye, as much as you are zealous of pneumaticos, again, gifts is italicized, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. And the point I'm making is that there's so much more to this teaching. And one of the things I'm encouraged about is that I'm about three-fourths of the way um, completed in transcribing that first uh, that first. Uh, Concerning the Monticos, that playlist, and I'm about three-fourths of the way there, and I'm so excited about that because, you know, I want to submit it to Brother Randy, and I'm hoping that someday there will be a book made out of this because it's just so relevant and so much, so, again, so uh, needful in, in, in the body of Christ. I mean, we're so ignorant about the things of God. We don't need, we don't need to, th we think we don't need to go a certain direction with God, but there's so much more happening, and, and I'm going to post that playlist right now. Playlist. This is in, in YouTube. Um, but again, that's called Concerning Umaticos, and it's about spirituals. And, uh, and it, again, it, it's, there's a whole realm of understanding what the things of the Spirit are and the Holy Ghost and how it all works. You know, the manifestation of the Spirit, etc. The administrations of Jesus Christ. The gifts of the Spirit, which is the charismas of the Holy Ghost. So anyway, um, I want to thank everyone for partaking today. It's 10:09, so we're going to get we're going to go ahead and pray now and end this out. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all the many brothers and sisters that are partaking today, Father. And I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that they would give themselves to your word, continue to meditate, continue to meditate and study and seek after you, Father God. For it is written in your word, Lord Jesus, that if blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for he shall be satisfied. I bless you, Lord God, for all those brothers and sisters that are satisfied today because they're seeking you. We bless you, Father, and we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that concludes the broadcast, amen. David, man, I'm about to end it. <laughs> Hallelujah. That concludes the broadcast for today, and uh, next week we're going to get into another teaching here. And we might cover 1 Corinthians 12, 1 a little bit just to uh, emphasize how much is needed, why it's so necessary, etc., and, and put a hunger in our hearts to want to seek after and learn, learn more of the things of God. And remember, whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. You're not going to get involved and be a spiritual son or daughter of God if you're involved in carnality. Amen.